Okay, so yesterday we um, we basically looked at uh, Klinas theorem at the end of the um, lecture, and we looked at the proof of Klinas theorem. Uh, we looked at the direction from regular languages to deterministic automata via Jozowski um, derivatives. And then I mentioned that an alternative proof to that direction would be to actually go from a um, regular expression to a non-deterministic finite automaton with um, epsilon transitions. And that is called the Thompson construction. And then in order to finish the proof of, of the theorem, you need to eliminate these epsilon positions and determinize the automata. Uh, Non-deterministic automata will make an appearance in today's lecture, and we're gonna see um, how they can be used uh, in to prove equivalence. Then in the opposite direction, we looked at going from deterministic finite automata to regular expressions. And we look at the method called state elimination that basically relies on the fact that if I have an automaton with one or two states, I can by hand actually compute the regular expression for each state of those automata. And then using that, so that knowledge for two states, you can start from an automaton with n states and using a very simple algorithm, eliminate um, one state at a time and basically end up building an automaton with just two, two states or one. So uh, what I want to do today in, in continuation of yesterday is talk a little bit about an alternative proof of um, that direction. So going from automata to expressions. And then after that, I want to talk about non-deterministic automata for five minutes. And then we're going to go on to um, co-induction up to, which is a, a technique to efficiently check for language equivalence of both deterministic and non-deterministic automata. And at the end, if there is time, I'm going to spend um, a few minutes uh, telling you about how co-induction up to can be phrased more generally using uh, concepts from um, category theory and, and co-algebra. Okay, so first let's um, continue from yesterday. And so remember that this two, two to one implication is I give you a deterministic finite automata finite automaton, and I want to build a regular expression that um, denotes the same language as this automaton accepts. And so an alternative proof to what I showed you yesterday is given by solving a system of equations of this shape. So if I have uh, an, an equation in Pliny algebra that has this shape, then you can show that um, there is a solution for this, that the least solution of this equation is R2 star R1. Let me put here the concatenation. So this is the solution for this equation. And you can um, generalize this to systems of equations. So you can, you can have X being a vector of, um, of variables, and then you can have a vector of uh, regular expressions, and you can have another vector, and you can generalize this and get the same solution using matrices. Okay. So how do I build these equations from the automata, right? So remember that the goal here is to go from a DFA to a regular expression. So what I need, I need to first from a DFA build a system of equations. Okay. And so let's imagine that my DFA has um, a transition function and an output function like this. Now I'm not sure these were the letters I used. Um, yeah, that's fine. So O of S and T of S. And remember that the notation we were using before that S of A stands for T of S of A. Okay. So using this notation, you can actually for every state S of an automaton, so I'm imagining this automaton has state space S, 
For every little s, I can build an equation as follows. I take a variable, which I'm going to call rs, and I'm going to write down an equation that basically says for every letter a, for every letter a, I make a transition to the variable corresponding to state sa. And then I add the output. So if it's a one, this gets a plus one. If it's a zero, it gets a plus zero that actually doesn't need to be, to be there. And once I build this system, I can then solve the system using this um, solution. And you can prove that um, the, the language recognized by the expressions that arise from this system of equations are actually the same languages as, as the states. So let me just quickly give you an example to make this um, concrete. So take the automaton we've been using as example in many slides, that is the one that says um, that accepts a number, an odd number of A's, okay? So let's imagine that this automaton has states X and Y. So the system of equations for this automaton would be two, two um, equations, Rx equals B Rx plus A Ry plus zero. But I, I'm not gonna write the plus zero because it's not really needed. Whereas the Ry equals B Ry plus A Rx plus one. And in this case, because it's only two it's only two equations. You could actually solve it by hand doing some sort of Gaussian elimination on this system. Um, but you can also translate this to a matrix system like I mentioned here by saying, okay, I have two variables, Rx, Ry. And this is equal to zero, one plus, and then I have here my square matrix that says, um, let me think. So Rx, Rx is a B, A, B, A. And then that um, times the same vector again, Rx, Ry. And then you can solve this system using this solution and you will get exactly the expression um, associated with each state X and Y. And the expression you get in this case actually happens to be the same as the one we got by state elimination, um, but it doesn't ha necessarily have to be the same. It's only an equivalent one. Okay, is this um, clear? And, oh, sorry, just one remark. You will notice here I have a two by two matrix, which I mentioned so lot yesterday as a very important basis of clean algebra, the fact that we can compute the star of a two by two matrix. And in this case, that's the formula we, we, which we would use is the one that um, I showed yesterday in one of the slides. Okay, Billy, are there questions so far? No questions, yes. Okay, cool, so I can move on. Oh, I actually had the matrix here, um, the start of the matrix. So I want to move on, uh, and I want to move on to um, non-deterministic finite automata. Okay, and here's an exercise. Here's an expression, a regular expression, that denotes what? That's a question for the audience. If the string starts with an arbitrary uh, sequence of A's and B's, and but the ending must be a sequence of an A followed by a, a string of four length of A's or B's. Okay, thank you. That is correct. Um, another way to describe this would be that the fifth symbol from the right is an A. So any word such that when you count from the right, you have an A in the fifth position. So that's correct. Now, how many states do I need in a deterministic finite automaton to accept this language? Best guess. Uh, 
just put numbers on the chat and Billy will take the upper bound. We have a couple of guesses so far. Okay, shoot. Uh, we've had two, we've had three, and we've had six, and we've had five. Oh, we've got a two to the five. Very different guess. Okay, okay, okay. So we have two, two, six, okay. Interesting. Uh, the answer is uh, 32, in fact. So the person who said two to the five um, is correct. How many states would I draw if, uh, if I draw it without, without thinking that I need to be deterministic? Well, uh, I guess that's what one of the people who answered five or six was thinking. If you look at this regular expression, you can sort of guess what, you know, what the automaton should look like. You say, okay, this first bit I do a plus B star, then I have an A here. And then as the person who, who spoke before said, you have to have a, a string of length four with either A's or B's. So the second part would be, would look like this. Three, four, and then the last state is accepted. Now, why is this uh, answer wrong? So I, I indeed have six states, which I guess is what some, some of the people in the chat were thinking. What is wrong with this answer? So what is sort of wrong with this answer is that I have these two A's coming out of the initial state. And if you remember the, the definition of a deterministic finite automaton for each A, I must have exactly, exactly one transition. However, I think we all agree that this gadget I just drew here seems to be much closer to the intuition of what this language is doing, okay? So, non-deterministic finite automata, so automata in which you can have multiple transitions labeled with the same letter or none, happen to be more compact than deterministic finite automata. So in the worst case or best case, depending on how you see it, they can be exponentially smaller than uh, the corresponding deterministic automaton accepting the same language. So what is the definition of an NFA? So pretty much like with DFAs, there's a set of states and there are transition functions, also O and T. But the difference now is, so this O is the same. So O is just a classifier of final and non-final on the states. But T is now, for, for every state and for every letter, T can return a set of states and that set might be empty. So power set of S is really all subsets of S, including the empty set, okay? And how do I accept a word here? Well, you say that the word, a word A1, AK is in the language of a, of a state if and only if there exists a path in the automaton starting in S ending in some state S prime such that the O of S prime is one. So basically you can have multiple paths labeled by the same word. And as long as one of them says accept, the automaton will say accept, okay? And, oh yeah, this was the automaton I drew. I drew above, drawn in nice LaTeX. And so this brings me to, um, to a, back to the proof of cleanest theorem. So we start from regular expressions and we build using Drozovsky derivatives, we build this deterministic finite automaton. But in fact, we can build a smaller 
non-deterministic finite automaton, which then still needs to be determinized to finish the proof, but um, it doesn't matter. So what this gives us is basically a construction from regular expressions to non-deterministic finite automata accepting the same language. And so um, this non-deterministic finite automata that you can build from expressions, because they are much smaller, they can then be used um, in things like parsing, compilers, um, you know, uh, grep, and so on. So you want to have, you can think of these NFAs corresponding to expressions as, a, as very efficient representations of the language the expression denotes. And so there's this thing called Antimirov derivatives, which goes back to Antimirov um, sometime in the, in the 70s, I believe. Um, and how do they work? Well, they look very much like Drozowski derivatives with one minor change. So let's do it. So if you remember yesterday from Drozowski derivatives, you, we had the following. If I had a plus, then I would return the plus of the derivatives. Now in Antimirov derivatives, we don't do that. Instead, we return a set with both derivatives. So this is one of the main changes in, in the definition. So you take the, the definition of Krasovsky derivatives and you basically just change the transition function in a way that every time you see a plus, you add a set. So remember again from Drozovsky for sequential composition, we had the following. Um, if R cannot skip, then I take the A from R. If R can skip, then I can take the A from R or I can take the A from S. And so now again, I just return a set and here I return the singleton set. So everywhere where you have a plus, you replace that by a set with several elements and all the rest you just put in a singleton set. And so you get this construction that allows you to go from regular expression straight on to uh, non deterministic finite automata. And this automata will typically be much smaller than the one um, that you build out of Prozovsky derivatives. There's other constructions out there that are um, interesting going both uh, to NF, mostly to NFAs. There's something called Glushkov automata or position automata, which is due to Gerard Berry and uh, Glushkov independently. And uh, that became popular inside a language called Esterel, which is a language used in um, verification of many things, but in particular embedded systems in airplanes. Um, and so in that language, it looks, so SRL is a language for um, control flow and, and data flow analysis. And there, there's a bunch of very efficient implementations of regular expressions that are based in this thing called the position automaton, which is basically, and the idea is that uh, if you start from a regular expression and you would know by some miracle that all the letters in the expression are different, then the construction to a non-deterministic finite automaton can be done in, in linear, um, can be linear in the size of the expression. And uh, what the Berry uh, SETI construction does and or the Glushkov construction is that, well, if you don't know they are different, just make them different. Just label all the letters differently. And starting from that expression, then you can build an automaton, then you delete the, let's say you put numbers on the letters to make them different. You delete all the numbers and there you go. You have an automaton that, that happens to recognize exactly the same language. And there's some really cool optimizations on these constructions out there. So it's, it's actually a pretty active um, field of, of research this going from expressions to automata and making it very efficient and, and generating compact uh, representations of, of languages. Okay, so this sort of um, concludes um, the part, well, concludes yesterday's lecture in some ways. So we, we looked at um, Kleene's theorem and different proofs. Um, and now, you know, we, we go from expressions to automata. 
And as I said in the very first lecture, the goal is to try to talk about equivalence of expressions. And given that now we went from expressions to automata, I would like to talk about um, equivalence via automata. So there what are two we questions want... about uh, anti morov derivatives, uh, maybe okay. before you move on, or uh, probably yep. quick. Uh, first question was just, uh, are these anti morov derivatives finite even without considering ACI? Ha, huh, that is a very good question. Um, okay, let's go back a little bit. So it's beautiful because if you look at the type of the derivatives, you have, you go from X, well, in the case of the regular expressions, really, I should have written You go from an expression to a given a letter to a set of expressions. And if you remember, what we did was replacing every plus in Drozovsky derivatives by a set like that. So in fact, when you put the elements of a sum inside a set, what are you doing? You are automatically doing ACI because a set, so if you had R plus R and you put this in a set, then you have only R. And if you have R plus S plus T and you put these things in a set, you will get R S T, which is the same thing you would get if you have R plus S plus T. So in fact, Antimirov is precisely doing ACI by construction by default because of the um, type. Okay, and the only other one was just asking why, I'm not totally sure what it's saying, but just why you're checking for skipping if you're going to return a set anyway. I think this might have been a reference to the- uh, To the concatenation. You wrote down, yeah. Uh, yeah that's true. Uh, you can write the, so I, what I did was basically take the definition of yesterday and adapt it, but you are right. So you can write this derivative a bit more compact, compactly by writing R A S and then union O of R dot S A. And now this thing here, if it's zero, you have to somehow build it in that if it's zero, the whole thing becomes the empty set. So you have to build in the fact that zero operates on sets as well or on expressions and, um, and gives me uh, the empty set. But yes, you could write this more compactly. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, thanks, Billy. Okay, so, um, so what I want to look at now is basically giving two DFAs or two states in a DFA, it doesn't matter, are they equivalent? So this means are, are their languages equivalent? And the same thing for NFAs. And um, what I wanna show you today is, is a construction that goes, um, goes back to, to the late eighties um, and is due to Hopcroft um, and someone else, sorry, and, and Carp, Hopcroft and Carp. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you how to improve on that construction. So what I'm gonna do, I'm first gonna show you how to do this construction by intuition, so a bit naively, and then we're gonna improve on that, okay? So let's say we start with um, two deterministic finite automata. To save a bit of space, I'm now abbreviating this notation with this. So basically, if you see a, um, a bar on top of a state, um, it means that the state is final. And we, we are given these two automata. One has three states. Um, the other one has two. 
and we ask the question, are these automata language equivalent? And if you stare at them for a moment, you will recognize that uh, this automaton here is the automaton that accepts an odd number of A's again. I now deleted the B's just to make it, to make it even simpler. So you will recognize that I like that automaton a lot. So this is the automaton that accepts an odd number of A's. And if you stare at this one for a little longer, you will see that it actually does the same thing, uh, but with one more state. So basically state X and state Z are really doing the same thing. Um, but uh, I just drew it like this to make it a little more interesting. And so imagine that I ask you, are these two automata the same? And you say, yes. And then the question is, can you show me? Can you convince me that these are the same? Or uh, perhaps more interestingly, can you write a program that really spits out yes when two of these gadgets are the same? So here's a way of doing it um, in, in a sort of slightly naive way. So if these two things are the same, then I must be able to compare them. So X and U, I must be able to compare them and conclude that they lead to the same number of paths. So these paths labeled by words that are accepted. And if they are not the same, as I explore the automaton, which is finite, so this is important, there's a finite number of states. As I explore this automaton, if they are not the same, I should be able to find out that they are not the same. In other words, I should be able to see a word in one automaton that is not accepted in the other. So how do I explore the state space of this automata exhaustively? Well, I start from X and U and I say, are X and U the same? Well, if they are the same, then after I do one A, they should be the same. But as I look at X and U, the first question I should ask is, are X and U final or non-final? Because if one is final and the other one is non-final, then you already have a counterexample because one accepts the empty word and the other one doesn't. But in this case, X and U are both non-final. So X and U uh, could be the same. So let's see what happens after one A step. After one A step, I reach Y and V. And Y and V happen to be final. So it's still looking good. So Y and V could be the same. And after I make an A step, I get to Z in the upper automaton and I get to U in the lower automaton. And so I ask the question, are Z and U the same? Okay, they are both non-final, so they could be the same. And after I do another A step, I basically go back to Y and V, which I have already looked at because I already have a, a green line in there. So when I have an orange line next to a green line, then I know that I have done an all around exploration of all the paths. So in this case, there's only one letter. So it's sort of, you know, it's sort of trivial because you keep just taking transitions. But if I had two letters then for every state, I had to look at two pairs and so on. So these things can get increasingly complicated. But in this case, there's only one letter. And basically, I mean, in the worst case scenario, I would see the Cartesian product of the state spaces. But in this case, with three steps, I basically have seen everything. And I have managed to write green lines everywhere, which means that so far, I haven't seen a difference in these two automata. And now I conclude, or I tell you that if I haven't seen a difference this far, I will never be able to see a difference because I have explored everything I can explore using my alphabet. And therefore, uh, my, what I want to argue is that these three green lines, which are three pairs, so the set of these three pairs, are in fact a proof that these two automata are equivalent. So let's see what happens when they are not equivalent. So here's another example. Again, my favorite um, automaton here at the bottom, and then uh, something else. And we do the same thing. So we first assume they might be equivalent and we start drawing the green line. So if we already checked if they are both final or non-final, we can draw a green line and then we take a step. 
And so in this case, we make it to where we were before, so Z and U. But after U, I go back to V. And fortunately, Z now doesn't go back to Y, but goes back to X. And so I now hit here a pair X, V, that is not good because this pair X is non-final and V is final. So this means that if I now go, go back and see which path brought me here, so that's the word A, A, A. So this word A, A, A is not accepted by X, but A, 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 which has an odd number of A's is definitely accepted by you. So through this construction, I've actually built a counterexample that shows me that these two things are not the same. Okay. Now, what is this construction and, and why is it correct? Um, before I tell you that, I, I have another example with two letters just to show you how um, fun this gets. Um, so, okay, again, you start with X and U, but now every time you put a green line, you, you add two red lines because you have to make an A transition and a B transition. So basically this line here is the A transition line and this one here is the B transition line. Okay, and this goes on. So again, I have two lines and then I have two lines and so on and so forth. And then at some point in this case, because they happen to be the same, I've actually drawn only green lines. So I've, I've seen all the lines I could draw. And again, these um, five pairs are a witness that X and U are the same, okay? Now let's um, look at the details of these green lines. So these green lines are a relation, so they are pairs, right? So the green line, so if, if one automaton has state space S and the other automaton has state space T, then what we have is basically a relation R that is a subset of pairs of these two uh, state spaces. And what I wanna say about this relation, so you, you remember that this relation was such that I kept taking transitions, A transitions on the pairs. And at some point I said, there's only green lines, meaning I've seen all the pairs. So how do we formalize that? This is what this definition does. So a, a relation of pairs like this is a proof of equivalence, which happens to be called a bisimulation. If when I have a pair in this relation, so X, R, Y, two things have to be true. So the first thing is their outputs have to be the same. So this was the final equals final check we were doing. And moreover, when I do a transition in X and I do a transition in Y for all letters, so for all letters in my alphabet, if I look at the derivative of X, that should be in relation to the derivative of Y. So what this definition basically tells me is that my relation, so in fact, I can draw an automaton structure on this relation because of these two properties. So these two properties here imply the existence of this transition structure. We yeah, cannot we've lost, see we've the lost your writing a little bit. Uh, okay, can you see the exist sign in green? Just black on the screen right now. Even on the, you mean on my screen or on the iPad screen? Uh, on the screen that you've shared. Okay. There we go. Back. Oh, it's back? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's back. 
because I see it all the time. So I'm not completely sure when you cannot see it. Can you see my video as well? Yep, we're all good. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, sorry, I lost track. Oh, no, I know where I was. So what we have is that if you can build such a relation that is a bi-simulation, then you have a proof that the two things accept the same language. And that's a, an extra theorem that one can, can prove. And I can uh, briefly sketch how to prove this if people are, um, are interested. Let me see what's my, next, what's my next slide. Okay, yeah. Oops. Uh, okay, so let me just quickly show you uh, how the proof of this theorem uh, actually goes. So I have two automata, let's call them X and Y. And for simplicity, I'm gonna use the same letters even though these are um, different functions. We can't see you writing right now, but hopefully it'll catch up. I'm going to turn off my video, see if that helps. There seems to be something happening in my network every day at uh, around this time, it seems. <laughs> Maybe some neighbor comes home. Um, is the, can you see the, the writing, Billy? I don't, I think we're still a ways behind. Uh, oh, wow, now, now we can, just updated. Okay, let me see, let me see. Okay, so what um, you've got now at once is the two automata that I drew. So X and, and Y are the state spaces of these two automata and R being a bi-simulation basically tells me that I can build an R here that also has an automata structure. And remember that R is a relation over X and Y. So I can look at the projections. So pi one, I guess you've seen this notation in other lectures, but pi one is just the first projection from a pair and pi two is the second projection of a pair. And you can show that the definition of bi-simulation, so these two things here, actually imply that these two diagrams commute, okay? So it basically implies that this arrow here, the yellow arrow here exists and that the diagrams commute. And why now can I conclude that this automata must accept the same language? So now here I'm gonna appeal to the diagram I showed you yesterday with the language semantics as a final co-algebra. And here is where um, some abstraction from category theory uh, is helpful. So, Okay, we've lost, I know. Your, we've lost your screen right now. <laughs> I was hoping it would come back in a bit, but it's been gone for a good uh, 10 or 15 seconds, so I think it might not. <laughs> okay, let's give it a couple of seconds and see what happens. A bunch of people in the chat pointing out that it definitely doesn't like category theory. Yeah, now I'm pretty afraid much that uh, <laughs> we start having some proof here. Every time I start drawing some diagrams, my internet, probably there's a oh, little... We're back. We're back. Can you see the purple thing? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. So there's this object, this purple object, which is the final algebra. And if you remember from yesterday, there's a unique language map from every automaton into it. Right. And now look how beautiful this can be. I'm still drawing arrows. 
so now we have, let me see how I'm gonna show this. We have one path from y to two to the a star. Let's call that L y. We have one path from X to two to the A star. Let's call that LX. And we have one path from R to two to the A star, which is, let's call it LR. But we also have something else. We actually have another path. I'm gonna draw it here from R all the way to two to the A star via X. And I have another path from R via Y to two to the A star. And these paths must coincide, meaning that LR must be the same as pi one, sorry, uh, must be the same as Lx composed with pi one and Lr must be the same as Ly composed with pi two. Okay. And so now you can see that because I have this common LR here, I'm actually pretty much done. Because what I have now here is that LX composed with pi one must be the same as LY composed with pi two. And because the projections um, are not doing anything to, to the states, you get the result you were looking for. Okay. So you can use, I mean, you, there's also an inductive proof on this, by the way. You can prove that every word in LX is a word in LY if there exists a Y simulation. Um, but the Proof I sketched here is more the, um, what some people would call the abstract nonsense proof that uses the uniqueness of the um, final calls. Okay, are there questions on, on any of this? And Billy, can you confirm that um, things are relatively okay? Uh, we've been blinking in and out from a black screen to not a black screen intermittently, kind of every eight seconds or so, a bit at random. I wasn't going to tell you every single time because, like, you know, it doesn't really seem worth it to tell you, but. Okay, but my voice is not being cut. Nope, not at all. That's bizarre. Okay, um, very good. So are there, are there questions uh, at this time or can I continue? Uh, you can you can continue. It, it it's difficult for people to follow sometimes with the screen blinking in and out there. Okay. Okay. So uh, next time the screen blinks, maybe uh, stop me so that I give a few seconds. It's been blinking maybe as you've been talking. I, maybe <laughs> Alex, you, you can try to reconnect. Okay. So I stop sharing and sharing again, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give it a try.
Okay. How is that? It. We can uh, we can see it. Uh, we'll see if it starts blinking at any point. <laughs> okay, let me know because I saw someone said something about a cable, but in fact, it cannot be the cable because I can see it on my screen all the time. I think it's the network really that is again dragging a bit for some reason. Okay, so the algorithm we saw in the previous slides, the naive algorithm taking pairs and taking transitions was in fact attempting to construct such a relation R, a bi-simulation. Now, if you do this naively, like uh, we did, there's a problem, which is that the algorithm that you end up with can be um, quadratic. So you can end up in the worst case scenario where your exploration of the state space needs to look at every single pair of states of the two automata. So here's um, such a worst case scenario. So these are two automata with five states. And if you run the algorithm we did before, here's what happens. My relation has zero pairs. I check them. Oh, uh, I removed the letters here. I'm assuming again, the alphabet has one letter, so I didn't draw them. And all the states are um, rejecting, meaning this automata actually accept the empty language. Um, but here's what the previous naive exploration algorithm would do. So you check the first two states. Okay, they are potentially the same. So you continue and you start adding these pairs to your relation and you go on. And you will see that because of the way the transition structure was done, every single time I'm sort of exploring more and more pairs that I haven't seen before. So I cannot really stop my process because I still have a red pair. I need to have only green pairs for the thing to be a bi-simulation. And so I go on, I go on, and eventually um, I stop because I've now seen all the pairs. I've seen 21, 21 pairs. Okay, now the question is, is this the best we can do? Is there something we did here that was so naive that we could immediately improve on? Does anyone have ideas? Can I delete some of these green lines that I put on the screen and why can I delete them if I can delete them? So in fact, I could have stopped much earlier. Um, and why is that? So let's go back a little bit. And let's, at the time we had nine pairs, let's ask ourselves the question, do I really need to add this pair here? Okay, can you see my pointer, Billy? Yep, yeah. Okay, cool. So this pair here, do I really need to add that? Well, according to my definition, yes, because these two states I haven't linked before. However, if these two states were not the same, isn't it the case that I would have already known? And why is that? Well, if you stare at this picture for a little bit, you will see that the question of are these two states the same can be recovered by saying, well, this state is the same as this state, which 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 is the same as this state. So in fact, this blue line here doesn't bring any new information because if I were to see a counterexample, I would have seen it so far because of the red path I can draw in my bi-simulation. So in fact, um, this is due to Hopcroft and Carp back in 71. When you are building your relation R, your bi-simulation R, remember that there were two conditions. So you need to check for every pair that their outputs are the same. And you need to check that the A transitions are in the relation as well. 
And what Hop Hopcroft and Carr proposed and showed it's correct to, to do is instead of doing that, you ask a different question. In fact, you ask whether the pair is in the reflexive transitive closure of the relation you're building. So when I get to this pair, let's call this pair um, U and V. So if I ask the question, you know, is V, are V and U in, in the R I'm building? Then the answer is no. But if I ask the question, are V and U in the reflexive transitive closure of the R I'm building? Then the answer is yes, because here we go. We have that path there, okay? And so basically changing slightly the definition allows you to stop much earlier. And so Hopcroft and Carr back in 71 proposed an algorithm that builds not a bi-simulation, but a bi but a, sorry, a relation R such that its reflexive transitive closure is a bi-simulation. And so by doing that, what they basically uh, proposed is a first instance of something called uh, co-induction up to or bi-simulation up to, which is I don't need to build this huge relation that is a proof. I build something smaller, which is not a proof, but I can complete it to be a proof. And at the time that they proposed this algorithm, they conjecture that the algorithm was um, actually linear. And then later on, um, Tarjan in 75 showed that their uh, proof had a slight mistake and the algorithm is not um, linear in the size of the state space, but is almost linear. So in fact, there's a um, constant which is based on log. Uh, so it's basically n log n. Um, and the log n part is log of a very large um, constant that comes from the Ackermann function. So it's actually n log alpha n where alpha, alpha comes from the Ackermann function. Um, and that's why Hopcroft and Karp in their experiments believed the thing to be linear because this factor here was really not um, visible. And so Tarjan proved in, in 75 um, that the complexity was a little bit um, different than what uh, had been conjectured in the original article. Okay, so this um, brings us to uh, basically the end of um, by simulation by simulation up to for deterministic automata. But as I said before, non-deterministic automata are actually more compact representations of languages. So the question is, can I take what I just showed you for deterministic automata and do it for non-deterministic automata. And if I can, can I even do better than what we've done so far? And so that's what I wanna show you for the, for the last um, 15 minutes of, of today's lecture. So before we do that, um, just repeating something I, I said um, before, Hope, the Hopcroft and Karp algorithm does not build a bi-simulation, but it builds a relation that can be completed to a bi-simulation. So this is what I said before. So it doesn't build the, the R, you need to take R star. So you need to take the reflexive transitive closure in order to get a bi-simulation. And so what this is in, in today's terminology is an algorithm that builds a bi-simulation up to equivalence, okay? Now, what do we do for non-deterministic automata? What we're gonna do naively to start with is to take two non-deterministic automata and we're gonna try to use the previous algorithm, but we're gonna on the fly determinize the automata. Because remember, so again, I drew two automata here over one letter, so I didn't write the letters. But remember what I said about the acceptance of NFAs, the only thing I need is that there exists a path that is accepting. So in order to do this existence proof, I need to basically determinize the automaton as I go. Let me show you this by example. It's much easier when you see it by example. So if I wanna show that X and U are equivalent, 
what I need to do, I need to sort of uh, take notes on the side. I cannot draw my lines in the automata anymore. And what I need to do is to say, okay, if X and U are the same, then when I take a transition, they should be the same. This is what we were doing before. But now note the difference. So U has a transition to both W and V. And W is non-accepting and V is accepting. So what we are writing here, I'm writing it with a plus, but really this is denoting the set VW. And the whole set as a state is accepting because there's an accepting state in there. So remember, a word is accepted in a non-deterministic finite automaton if there exists a path. So if one of the states is accepting, that's it, we accept. Okay, so now we, we continue. So now we have Y here. What, does, what can Y do? Y can only go to Z. So Y goes to Z. And V plus W, where can it go? Well, V can go to W and W can go to U. So V plus W together can go to U plus W. And again, this, this pair here is non-accepting, so that's okay, so we can do the next step. And so in the next step, Z goes to X plus Y. And U plus W goes to U plus V plus W. And now we have again a set with x, y and a set with u, v plus w. So we again take a transition and x plus y goes to y plus z. And this, um, this set here just loops and then you do it again. And eventually you loop and you have seen only uh, green lines. Okay, so what did we do? We did two things. We determinized the automaton And at the same time, we applied Hopcroft and Carp. And we did this together. So we did this on the fly. And so the claim is that this relation here, so the R that basically contains all these pairs, is a bisimulation between the determinized automata. And that is a proof that these non-deterministic automata accept the same line. Okay, and again, we have to prove correctness of this method, but it is, um, it is a way of basically getting a language equivalence for non-terministic automata. But now I ask the same question as I asked before. So these are, we have one, two, three, four, five, six pairs, and we've done a lot of, you know, a determinization can go from n states to two to the n states in the worst case if the automaton happens to, um, if all subsets happen to be reachable. Um, so for instance, the first automata, the determinization of this automaton uh, could in principle have eight states. We explored six. So we've explored here six out of the eight states of the deterministic version of that automaton. And we explored four out of the eight states that the deterministic version of this automaton would have. But can we do better? So could I have stopped this proof earlier? So who thinks yes and who thinks no? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing um, that by now you, you know the answer is yes, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't be uh, asking it. So we, in fact, this proof, again, uh, can be improved. And so in the same spirit as Hopcroft and Carp, so Hopcroft and Carp used the structure of the relation to improve their proof method. But now we have more than just the relation. We have both the relation that comes from Hopcroft and Carp, but we also have this deterministic version of a non-deterministic automaton. And it so happens that that construction that goes from a deterministic, uh, sorry, from a non-deterministic automaton to a deterministic automaton 
has algebraic properties that can be actually taken into account when doing these proofs. And so here's how we can do better. So in fact, so this is the same automata as before. And I'm gonna argue that when we hit the third, sorry, the fourth pair, I could have stopped. And why is that? Okay, let's think for a moment and let's take a pause and um, think about what the deterministic version of a non-deterministic automaton has as algebraic property. So if I have a deterministic automaton, and now I'm doing a little bit of category theory, so this is the moment the internet will probably collapse. If I have a um, non-deterministic automaton like this, the deterministic version, I believe Tarmo uh, talked about monads, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, there's been I'm some discussion at... of monads. Okay, so did he mention the power set monad by any chance? That would have been helpful. I don't think so. Okay, <clears throat> Tarmo. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's this monad called the power set monad. I'm going to write it here on this side. So the power set monad um, has as unit the singleton set map and as multiplication the big union. So remember that, I mean, the unit is supposed to be like this. So it takes a little x and it maps it to the singleton with a little x. And the multiplication is supposed to, to take sets of sets and give me a set back. So it basically takes a big set of sets and just maps it to the union of all um, sets in there. And um, because we have that monad, you can actually capture, oops, sorry, we can actually capture the determinization of the automata in the following way. So here I take the unit. So for every state in the automaton that I start with, I just create a new automaton where I put all the singleton sets. And then I build a function here, which really is the determinization function. So if here I have OT, here I'm gonna take, let's call it O hat, T hat. And this function is built in a way that it commutes with the unit of the monad. And O hat basically takes a set U and just gives me one or zero. And it gives me one if there exists a U in U such that the set was final. Whereas the T hat of U for a letter A gives me the union of all transitions that I could do with the original automaton. And this is exactly what we did here when we were collecting things. And so this, this subset construction can be written in this um, diagram. And now I can plug back my final co-algebra. So I can plug it back and I can plug it back in a way that tells me that the language, so the language of a state here is really the language of the singleton set in the determina determinized automaton. But here's the beautiful thing about this map L. The power set monad happens to be the monad whose algebras are joint semi-lattices. And so it so happens that two to the a star, the final co-algebra, you can show this, 
can also be given a joint semi structure, basically by taking language union. And the map L has this property that if I take a set with a bunch of letters in there, a bunch of states, then you can show that the map L is in fact a joint semi-lattice map, meaning that the language of this set can be split into smaller pieces in any way you want. I could split it like this. I could split it in all singletons. Billy, um, can you yeah, see Alex, my you, screen? Or? You just started mm -hmm. flashing. Uh, is it easy to stop screen sharing and start again? Because that did seem to work last time. It is easy, I hope. Okay, it's the category theory. How's that? Seems to be working so far. I managed to mute myself, I think. No, it's okay. Okay. So the language map inherits the joint semi-lattice property of the power set monad. And it is that fact that allows me to stop earlier. And how do I show that? So if I'm looking at the language of X plus Y and at the language of U, V and W, do I know something about these languages just by looking at the pairs that I've seen so far using the fact that L is a joint semi-lattice map? Can anyone guess this? What do I know about X plus Y? The default is to ask Marco, so. So I know that the language of X, Y is the language of X union the language of Y. But remember that I've seen X and Y before. So in fact, the language of X union, the language of Y should be the same as the language of U union, the language of V, W. Ha, but look. We've just lost you, by the way. <laughs> you lost me completely. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Why do? Can you hear me or? Yeah, yeah, uh, we've just, it, the screen was black for a good 10 seconds, but uh, I can see again, we're good. Can see again? So the language of X and the language of Y has to be the same as the language of U, V and W because I've seen those pairs before. And so this pair X plus Y and U plus V plus W is something I have seen before. And so at this point, I could have stopped my proof. Because if they were different, I would have seen the difference before. Okay, and so this is basically uh, what I have in this um, next slide is that you can split these sets into smaller components because you know that the language map is a joint semi-lattice map. 
And this is a technique called by simulation up to um, union that um, you can use to, uh, to have smaller proofs of non-deterministic automata. And what is interesting is that you can do even better. So you can do even better than by simulations up to union. And um, given the time, I'm gonna just very quickly show this and then I'm gonna conclude so that you guys have your break. So the, the, the you can manipulate them as elements of this joint semi-lattice generated by um, the languages. And so you can actually replace anything that you've seen in a proof. So any pair like this one and two, you can replace that in any equational reasoning that you do about states. So in particular, what, I, what you can see here is that once I encounter the pair X plus Y, and I want to compare it with you, I cannot compare it directly just using the two pairs, but I can do the following reasoning. I can say that X plus Y is the same as U plus Y using pair one, which is the same as Y plus Z plus Y using pair two. But now this is a set or a joint semi-lattice. So Y plus Y is Y. Therefore, Y plus Z plus Y is Y plus Z. But Y plus Z is the same as U using two again. So in fact, you can show that X plus Y is U by sort of doing a round the clock um, thing in the by simulation. And so what we're doing here is by simulation up to union, but also up to congruence. So you can replace anything you've seen anywhere in your reasoning. And this is um, um, an algorithm due to uh, Filippo Bonchi and Damia Pus back in 20. 13 only. So it's actually a relatively recent algorithm that improves on Hopcroft and um, CARP's algorithm. And so I'm gonna um, stop here um, because my next slide was again, something with uh, category theory. So I bet that uh, the internet would completely collapse if I go on this. Uh, I will start with this tomorrow um, because it seems uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I get forgiven when I talk about category theory. Um, but basically, let's just briefly summarize what we saw today. So we saw basically taking automata, deterministic or non-deterministic, and if you want to show that um, they accept the same language, you can use this very um, naive algorithm of building relations, and you can improve on that algorithm in order to build smaller and smaller proofs of equivalence. And in fact, these algorithms can be implemented very efficiently. And one thing I forgot to mention is that Hopcroft and Karp's algorithm, so the check for the reflexive, reflexive transitive closure can be done very efficiently using a data structure called union find. And this is something that is described in their, in their uh, textbook and, and in many papers um, online. And so for Philippe Bonke and Damia Pou's algorithm, there's also some efficient data structures you can use to represent um, some of these checks in the joint semi-lattice. And so there's this interesting sort of relation between these theoretical ideas behind the algorithms and then the data structures, you need to implement them efficiently. And in this lecture, I, I didn't go at all into the data structures, but there's a lot of material out there uh, which can give you a lot of fun if you try to implement such data, data structures. So, um, okay, I'll stop here. And then next time um, we're gonna look at equivalence using the axioms, the algebra, and we're gonna look at, at completeness as well. And I'm happy to take some questions now. I'll stop sharing so that Maybe the internet gets a bit better. Billy, do I have questions or is everyone oh. <laughs> extremely bored? I wanted to ask one thing at least, although I'm not really sure. Uh, okay, so um, in, the, in the complexity of the CARP algorithm that you showed, the one that had that log feature, that featured um, the, 
the log with respect to something that involved the Ackermann function. Does that come from the complexity of union finding or is that yeah. irrespective of like the actual data structure? Okay. Uh, no, it's, it's um, I'm 99% sure it comes from the, um, from the union find. Because it just seems like such a, a strange thing to come up in this context that I feel like I would need to ask yeah. more about it. <laughs> So someone pasted the ref to a co-induction up to, that is correct. And it's Hopcroft, carp and congruence, not Kraft. Kraft is the mayonnaise or ketchup brand, right? Carp, K-A-R-P. And there's no Tarjan in the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> 